So what we did last week was we talked about feature grammars. So the week before, chapter 8, we were doing context-free grammars that ignored the words around it and only focused on parts of speech. This section is about feature grammars. And the nice thing about feature grammars is they allow us to write, let's say you wanted to write a chat box, this would be necessary to come up with accurate grammatical sentences. They are harder to write um, because languages are so creative and flexible. Um, but this also would allow us, if we can parse sentences with these feature grammars, to examine the grammar structure, to examine entity relationships. So now I can tell you kind of how deep the noun phrase is. Also, I can um, process maybe past tense better, those sorts of things. Okay. Um, and we ended thinking about uh, this sort of featural structure where we have um, requirements for an inverted or an auxiliary clause. And these are really tricky in English because they, they require, they have an um, implied noun phrase at the beginning, uh, and so it's inverted. So do you is, is an implied you are the subject of the sentence, right? Um, and so tracking those can be tricky because it looks like there's no beginning noun phrase. And uh, so pretty much always, most languages require subject, verb, object. Um, so here, the subject is inverted as the second noun phrase. Okay. And so that's kind of where we ended last week. Um, this week, we're just going to finish all that up, and you'll get to write your own feature grammar. Okay. And then I have some comments on Chapter 8. Okay. Uh, so with some words, uh, we have these complements, and these are not like, hey, look nice. These are <laughs> words that are required to go with them. Um, so they're obligatory, uh, such as put or like. So you really can't say he put, there's like a what there, like he put what, right? Um, or he like. Um, in informal English, we could do that, right? Um, and so uh, there's this kind of like, I like, ooh, I like, you know, sort of that um, slang. But there's an implied it pronoun there um, that we just aren't using. So anytime you think about slang with these sorts of things, remember that their slang often has these implied either nouns or verbs that we've dropped. Generally, an, a noun, a pronoun referent that we've dropped. Okay. Um, but there are times when you can drop a compliment. So uh, which card do you put into the slot? Okay. Kim knows what you like. So now we've kind of dropped the compliment. Uh, and so there has to be some sort of filler. So these are called unbounded dependency constructions where there are normally obligatory requirements that given a certain scenario, you can um, drop that requirement. So uh, there are complements that can either that either are obligatory or require a filler. So it's kind of this either or option of I need it to have this filler or I need it to include the complement. Now, um, those are kind of called gap sentences. Okay. So which card do you put into the slot? There's a gap here for put. Um, and really, we're talking about putting the card. So this is actually almost an inverted clause as well. And the complement is implied. It's card here. Um, uh, but it's omitted here to, after the verb. And so for this particular sentence, you would have to figure out the gap filler, or you would have to understand it as an inverted WH kind of sentence. Um, these only work with the gap, though, because otherwise they're pretty awkward. So which card do you put this into the slot? Because you put this is a valid phrase. It's a little awkward as well, but you put that. Um, um, you could also say you put... Uh, the cat out. We did this already. So which card do you put the cat out into the slot? Doesn't make sense, right? And so this particular one, the gap here, is is necessary. Okay. Um, Kim knows what you like. If you wanted to say you like sushi, for example. Uh, so I was going to, I'm going to Boston, and I told my friend I needed good sushi. So Kim knows what you like sushi doesn't work because the what 
is the, the filler. So the relationship between a filler and a gap is called a dependency. And understanding when people use these is really fascinating because they're so awkward for computers to process. So is there a specific set of things that we can put between fillers and gaps? Are there rules that, are, that, that govern what is happening between these things? And unfortunately, the answer is no. And so I told you, look, this whole semester, I told you the, the main theme was being that English is, is a weird language, or dumb language, if you will. And because of recursion, remember recursion is the idea that you can say, I think that, I think that, I think, etc. cetera. Um, and creativity, there's no real rule about fillers and gaps. So this is uh, where feature grammars tend to be very difficult, um, is that these are natural for, for, for us to process, but for computers, these are very, very difficult. Um, because they don't follow one set of systematic rules, whereas like things like inverted clauses are also a little weird, but they follow a set of rules about um, auxiliary verbs, right? It tends to be verb, noun phrase, verb phrase, right? this extra auxiliary verb, whereas gap dependencies are um, a little more up in the air, right? because we could um, we could fill in as many in, um, recursive phrases that we want in these particular things. So sometimes these are called slash categories. Okay. Um, and the way that you can do them is create them to look like, ah, oh, it's an inverted cause, uh, uh, inverted clause, because we've got the do you option, so an inverted auxiliary slash noun phrase, okay. and there, the slashes indicate that it's missing a component because of these filler gap rules. Okay. So an S slash NP is a sentence that's missing a noun phrase. So this one here is a particular sentence is missing a noun phrase. Okay. The noun phrase is technically over here in this previous sentence, um, so who, portion of the sentence. Okay. But uh, do you like is actually its own sentence. So it's an inverted, claw, an inverted auxiliary um, missing a noun phrase, because see, it starts with a verb. Then there's the noun phrase. Uh, and this is a verb phrase. It's also missing its noun phrase. Okay. So this one's actually got two of them. It's the original noun phrase is missing. Okay, so, so if I said, do you like, if I showed you a picture of something, said, do you like, um, that would be this, uh, the right side here. And essentially what's happening is we have this inverted auxiliary, which we've already looked at. So do you is always this sort of inverted auxiliary, but there's no noun phrase. It starts with a verb. Sentences that start with a verb are very odd. Um, and then there's no noun phrase for like, which requires a complement. Okay. Um, and that's because it's an implied it. Do you like it? Do you like this? There's an implied empty pronoun. So there's an empty noun phrase. So you can kind of still build these in the feature grammar we've been working with, but you have to add in this component that every once in a while it's going to be missing this piece. And usually the missing piece is a noun phrase. Almost all the time it's a noun phrase. I'm trying to think if there's a time where it's a verb phrase. I'm sure there is, but I can't think of an example. Uh, generally, slash components are things that are missing some phrase that's missing a noun phrase. So one thing that you'll do is using the feature grammar provided by the book. Um, how do you make the graph? This is drawn. This depends. I feel like you asked me this last week too. So it depends on if the particular feature processing grammar has a draw option. Um, in some of these, they have a draw, and some of them they don't. Um, and so if I were trying to do one that didn't have a draw option, I would draw. I would use, like, literally, there's this website called draw.io that I love the heck out of. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that allows me to make these kinds of flowcharts for free. 
and so you can make sentence diagrams out of them. In Python, if it doesn't have the draw option, I would think this this is beyond my skill set, <laughs> to, to be totally honest with you, draw, doing that kind of drawing. Um, it's, uh, so I always just go to draw.io. Um, I think, I'm not sure, I guess we could look here um, if the feature grammar has the draw option here in a second. Um, so anyways, how do we write these? This is a feature grammar that's provided with NLTK. That's a really good um, example grammar. So you can let me show you the whole shebang. Hold on, let's look at it over here because it's quite, it is pretty long. Let's make this a reasonable size. Here we go. So here's the grammar. <laughs> And so it's got starting with a sentence. It is sentences can be a noun phrase. And remember, this is the feature grammar part with a verb phrase where the subject verb has to agree. <laughs> the noun phrase can have um, a what's called a pro here. Uh, and that's defined a little bit later what the pro options are. A noun phrase can also be a determinant and a noun. A verb phrase here can be intransitive. The verb phrase can be transitive and require a direct object. That's a noun phrase. Then this one actually gets into singular determiners. Okay, this is German. Um, I think I forgot to say this. Um, that's why some of these case arguments are here. So our determinant options are there are three different types of case, which I would have called this um, like the way that you address someone. Um, the gender here is masculine, this third person was singular. For feminine nouns, here are the options. Um, for plural determiners, uh, notice that we've dropped the gender component here, because it's not necessary. Then AGR is a combination of all of the different um, uh, requirements here. So don't forget that this is an embedded nested group here. Uh, it's in German to show you a different language uh, because German has some extra components that English does not. Unfortunately, most of the class is in English because um, the people who wrote this wrote this in English, but here's an example that's not finally, right? Uh, but all cases is the way that you might address something or someone, or there's like three nominative, dative, and I don't remember what ACC stands for, but there's different uh, the and A's for German. Mm -hmm. um, mainly here, I wanted you guys to see that this is that uh, set. It's a, a, a nested set for these. And we've got pro here as for our pronouns. And there are a bunch of different pronoun options. We had a bunch of different verbs, and then our transitive and intransitive verb combinations. Okay. Um, so this is an example where we could create a much larger set. And you could tell it to break down a, a sentence. So let's see if this one has a, a, a printing option. Let's see if this one has a draw option. Do instead of print here, we would do tree dot draw. See if it uh, yells at us. Nope. Okay. So uh, the answer to your question is that this one does have the draw option. It doesn't quite look like, um, and I don't think I can make it any bit. Since it's a picture, I cannot literally make this text any larger. Um, but since it's probably drawn with matplotlib, you could probably blow up the text a little bit. But uh, this would be the breakdown of that particular um, sentence. Ich folge dein Katzen, I think. German is not that good. Um, so this one does have the draw option. Oop, made it mad. So let's look at it just in tree format. So we've got a sentence here that's broken down into a noun phrase. That noun phrase includes a pronoun, then a verb phrase, 
which includes a transitive verb and then a separate noun phrase with a particular determinant and um, noun. So going back over here, zoom out a little bit more. There we go. <clears throat> and so uh, the real comment here, this is uh, a couple of you have asked me this question uh, through email, but also I wanted to make this comment about chapter eight. When things fail, they can, it can be difficult to figure out why it fails. Okay. And so on the chapter eight homework or chapter assignment, the, a, lot, a couple of you emailed me and said, I did, I'm not getting any output. Okay. When you don't see any output, it's because your parser has failed and it can't figure out the tree because either there's something wrong with the grammar and it, it doesn't find the logical tree based on the grammar that you've included, or um, the words are not in the grammar. And so sometimes that will give you an error message and sometimes that will, um, that will just print nothing. Uh, the infinite loop option is more likely on a sh no, not to produce recursive descent parser if you have embedded noun phrases. So if you say a noun phrase can be a preposition phrase and a noun phrase, that's really where they'll get stuck. Most um, feature grammars don't get stuck. They're too specific. And so they end up being um, set up in such a way that it can't figure out what you want it to break the sentence down in because the options that it has don't match the sentence. Uh, so these are less likely to loop and they're more likely to, to not produce output because there is no answer given the input and the rules. Um, yes, well, if there's no output, what you can do, which is on this slide, Great question, is to use the trace option. This applies for last week's assignment and this week's assignment. So when you load a parser or build a parser through um, your own writing, so this is a great time to also go back and talk about, um, I've got to find it. So when you're doing a recursive descent parser, right, you could do it here. So you do comma, trace equals. So anytime you were like building the parser part, um, you can use this. So in the shift reduce parser, you do it here. Go back over here. Um, but here we've just loaded a parser that's already built. And notice here we have this trace equals two. Okay. What that does is it shows us the process through which it decided to break down the sentence. And that trace option is actually in this chapter as well. Um, I just don't think we totally covered it. It's in the, the book chapter, but I skipped a little bit of the some of the examples because otherwise it gets insanely long. Um, but this trace option is really great for uh, checking out what happened and when it fails. So in this particular example, I'm gonna have to close this and go back to it because it's pretty long. What happens is that there are two particular options for the DEN determinant. And here's how you read this, okay? Here's the sentence um, as it's being processed. So this is the, the words that it's got. Okay. The first thing that happens, okay, it tells you where, what all the words are. These are a combination, uh, combination parsers, so it tends to start with a shift reduce. Okay. And so the first thing it finds is um, the first word and figures out that it's this particular pronoun. Okay. You do have to have all of the words embedded in the grammar, don't forget, because if you don't have a word in the grammar, it's not going to run. Okay. How did it read through the punctuation? There is no punctuation. This is just how it prints. So here's the words, and the tokens themselves is just a list of individual words. This is just how the trace options print, each word followed by a period. What, what do you mean? The split option here is going to remove a lot of those. 
Um, so we've just put in one sentence. If you've got multiple sentences, you would have to uh, would have to word tokenize them first. Are sentence tokenized? It might be sentence. Uh, you, okay, sorry. For these types of parsers, you tend to do one sentence at a time. So the uh, workflow might be to take a paragraph, sentence tokenize it so that you have a set of sentences, and then word tokenize each individual sentence so that you are feeding it one sentence tokenized by word at a time. And then you will have lost all of the commas and semicolons. I'm getting to your question about tracing in just a second. Right, it doesn't recognize food, right? Excellent. That means that you have to um, go back and in the grammar make sure the word food is in there. It's not the period that's causing the problem. It shouldn't be. It should have gotten taken out. But the word food may not be in there. Otherwise, tell it to remove punctuation as well. All right, perfect. So back to your question about in the log, how can we tell what's going wrong? Okay, working through this. So first thing it figures out is that, okay, this is a pronoun. Excellent. And then the next one it um, gets pulled in is this um, uh, noun. I think it's a noun. Right. And so it figures out, okay, the noun phrase that I'm gonna use is a pronoun here. Or I'm sorry, let me back up one. That's the verb. Um, it, it first thing that happens is it finds that this is a pronoun. And if I scroll up here, I can see that a noun phrase here can be just a pronoun. So it does a, a shift reduce and makes that pronoun into the noun phrase. So it pops it up. Now we've hit the second word which is a transitive verb. I'll come down here. Um, and with that second word, wherever it gets pulled in, here, it's here, it figures out that, oh, I can make a sentence into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And with that second word, I now have a verb phrase. So I'm gonna make this into a sentence that is now a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And then it hits the fact that uh, the verb phrase can be, uh, has to be the transitive option because this verb is transitive. And that means there was a required noun phrase. And so it's going to look for the options here that it can make a transitive verb and a noun phrase match to build this sentence structure. So it knows there's a sentence with a noun phrase. And then now there's the verb phrase. Okay, I'm good. But this particular verb phrase has to have a trans transitive verb and another noun phrase, so it's looking for the other noun phrase. That noun phrase includes a determinant, so it finds the determiner, but this particular determiner has two options. And so here, back to your question, um, is where things start to not go wrong, but require, have two different paths. So notice that all of these here have one um, sort of bar to star. So the way I remember this, right? So um, this bar part here tells you what section it's processing. So it's processing word one still, and um, has one path from bar to star. Here, there's two, there's starting to be a problem because there's gonna be two paths. So this one still has one bar to star. Here, there's two. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's not where it is, it's here. So there's one path here that this is a determiner, uh, but there's also a different path where it's a different determiner. So this particular determiner can be a singular third person masculine, or it can be a plural third person. And so here's where it breaks down, so to speak, is because it could be either this singular option or this plural option. And so anytime there are two here, that means that there are two paths this could take. Um, now this one does resolve because um, it matches the uh, noun that comes next, right? Um, 
it ends up being just one, but your particular sentence might have two paths and then it just stops because it can't figure out which path it should take. Um, and it'll tell you, it has a little error message. It's not an error message, it kind of just tells you where it stopped because it can't figure out from there. Um, but this one does resolve um, because the noun that comes next is, um, is uh, matches. All right, wait, is this one? Yeah, this one does resolve. Um, because the plural third person noun can match to the plural third person um, determinant. So it gets to having two spots here where it's either singular masculine determinant or a plural third person determinant. And once you finally find that last word, you're like, oh, okay, it's this version of the sentence. So when it makes the feature map, uh, or the sentence match here, you'll see that it picks DEN that's the third, plural third person and not DEN that's the masculine singular, singular. So in a sense, it's on hold while it's processing because it has to find that next noun. If we mixed, mismatched these and put in a singular female noun, this would totally break down because there is no way to match a plural third person noun to a singular female noun because the options are plural third person or singular male. Okay. But this one does end up matching because um, the determinant doesn't care if it's female as long as it's plural and third person. Okay. Um, so these trace ones, I find these hard to read at first. You just kind of have to think of it. You have to have a look at where the first section here of what word it's working with and what the rule is that it's currently trying to do. So anytime you see this sort of thing, that's the rule that it's currently using. Okay. Um, and then anytime you see the actual word, it is mapping that word onto its category. Um, and so it's actually sometimes easier to start at the bottom and work your way up, which is not the way that it works. Um, but here I can tell that this went okay. Um, because essentially what it did was it matched the singular um, the cat's option to a an option that is available in the determinants. Um, and so the trace options are really useful when they break down uh, to see where it could not find a combination. So it might be a combination that you either left out a word or it might be a combination that you haven't thought of to program. And so what a lot of people do in these is program a basic set of rules and run their sentences through until it breaks down and then start adding complexity from there to, to build out all of the possible combinations. Um, 